Thank you. I was just reminded here that um, Sir John Curtis and I were sitting here exactly a, a year ago uh, at the very first public opinion and Brexit conference. And I'm thinking that we're not actually any closer to knowing what the outcome of Brexit will be uh, 12 months later. But on the other hand, I think we, if anything, public opinion is even more important today than it was 12 months ago, because now, of course, it might inform not only party position, but it might even be uh, a second referendum. And who better to kick off this conference on public opinion and Brexit than Sir John Curtis? Of course, he's really the only political scientist probably who doesn't need any introduction. Uh, he is the most famous. Uh, he even has his own fan Twitter account. <laughs> is Sir John Curtis on TV. Uh, you should follow it. Um, uh, and also he's professor at the University of Strathclyde. He's senior research fellow at the Natsen. And he is uh, definitely the most astute observer of public opinion. And he's going to tell us uh, today about what are public attitudes towards the current situation in Brexit, the current impasse. So thank you so much, John. OK, thank you very much. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of important things today, about identity, about the impact of uh, Brexit on the devolved nations, etc. Um, all This is, however, an attempt to address where public opinion stands on the issues that are currently uh, uh, the subject of the Brexit impasse inside uh, the House of Commons. Um, and to that extent, at least, is really contemporary journalism rather than academic research. But hopefully it might enable us to have a discussion about where we think this process might be going. So I will try to avoid not to speak for much more than half an hour. Um, I want to ask uh, five questions. Uh, the first is, what did voters make of Mrs May's compromise? My premise behind all of this is that so far, basically, everybody has been in search of the compromise that will bring the country together. Mrs May has uh, been very explicit in saying that her deal is a compromise. It's a compromise in part between what the UK government wanted and what the EU wanted, but it's also a compromise between, on the one hand, the Prime Minister's understanding of what the 52% voted for, but then at the same time, in particular, meeting some of the economic concerns of the 48%. Strikingly, although this perhaps is not a similarity that is usually pointed out, Jeremy Corbyn is also in search of the Brexit compromise. His compromise is a softer compromise than the Prime Minister's compromise, but again, he's very explicit in saying that what we're looking for is something that will bring the 17 million and the 16 million together. So, Looking, first of all, at Mrs May's compromise is, as it were, a starting point for investigating whether or not, indeed, it might be possible to find a compromise that might satisfy public opinion. And by satisfy public opinion, I essentially have two tests. The first is that it should be popular amongst the public as a whole. At least more people in favour than against, and preferably a fair number of pe more people in favour than against. The second condition is that it should be supported, or at least there should be more supporters than opponents amongst both Remainers and Leavers. And the question I want to essentially ask is, is there anything out there that's being discussed by the House of Commons and more broadly that satisfies those conditions? Um, so I'm starting with Mrs May's compromise because this is, as it were, the most immediate example we've got of where the public have been evaluating a compromise. We can then go on to look at, say, well, how my alternative compromises fare. And then inevitably, given the uh, discussion that's going on, I want to look in particular about attitudes towards passing the decision back to voters, which is one of the, uh, uh, as it was, a procedural answer rather than a substantive answer to the Brexit impasse. And then, and to be honest, this is a bit more of a condenser rather than something that's central to the development of the talk. But I want to talk a little bit about um, where does the supporters of the political parties stand on Brexit and what are the opportunities and the constraints facing the parties as they also attempt to find a compromise uh, 
that might satisfy their voters. Well, um, not only did Mrs May's compromise bomb in the House of Commons last week, it frankly also bombed in the Court of Public Opinion. Uh, here you've got the readings by YouGov. I think they asked the question on 13 occasions, immediately on the 15th of November, all the way through to not before the meaningful vote uh, last week. Uh, the green line are those people who said that they opposed the deal. Um, uh, the blue line are those who thought it was a good idea. And the, the, red, the, the uh, dark line in the middle of the don't knows. So one important caveat about any of this, it's still the case that around 30% of people go, Mrs. May's deal, what's that? To be honest, I haven't got the foggiest whether I support it or not. So that's obviously a caveat. But insofar as the public do express an opinion, YouGov's polls have consistently found at least twice as many people who say they're opposed to the deal than say they are in favour. And to that extent, at least by this very simple measure, Mrs May's deal didn't go down terribly well. Indeed, the, how badly Mrs May's deal went down is illustrated by a time series that ORB have been asking every month. So this goes back to the, uh, the left-hand side, this goes back to the autumn of 2016. And they've been asking this question regularly, do you think that the Prime Minister is going to get the right deal for Britain in the Brussels negotiations? Um, you can see, uh, for example, the impact of the 2017 general election, which is the point at which the Green Line, which are those who don't think she's going to get a good deal, overtakes the blue line of those who do. And it's a reminder of the many ways in which the walk in Wales proved to be somewhat disastrous for the Prime Minister. Um, but as you then proceed uh, from left to right, you eventually get uh, a hump in the hill, and that's the Chequers Agreement, which, of course, was another attempt at compromise. But the Chequers Agreement had the, uh, bit, uh, had the impact of basically particularly casting doubt in the minds of Leave voters about whether Mrs May was going to get a good deal. The two readings on the far right-hand side are of the readings that ORB have taken since the publication of the draft deal. So the question now is, do you think she's got the right deal? And you will notice that the blue line and the proportion of people who think that she is, is now going to get a right deal is actually even lower than the already very low line uh, of a proportion of people who thought that she was going to get a good deal um, as of October of last year. So Mrs May even managed to surpass the pessimism of the voters in terms of the actual reaction to the deal that she came up with. Another thing that in truth has been remarkable about Mrs May's deal is that she has indeed managed to bring the country together <laughs> very successfully. We might not be surprised that Remain voters didn't think it was a terribly good deal because, you know, we might think that Remain voters frankly think that any deal is pretty lousy. But even Leave voters were almost as opposed to the deal as Remain voters. Not, of course, however, necessarily for the same reason. But, and here, again, here's kind of clue number one as to the potential divergent reasons of Remain and Leave voters. Uh, these are a number of polls that have, been, uh, that have asked people um, how you would vote if you had the three-way Justin Greening referendum of uh, between a remaining, leaving without a deal, and leaving with, his, with Mrs May's deal. Uh, the top line are indeed the people who say they vote remain. It's uh, more popular, though the figure is less than 50%. Then uh, the red line are the people who would vote for leaving without a deal. And the green line is Mrs May's compromise. And as you will see, in most, though not absolutely all of the polls, Mrs May's compromise came third. Which, of course, is suggestive that quite a lot of Leave voters out there, at the end of the day, would prefer not to have a deal. And this is illustrated here from three of these polls, breaking them down. According to the views of Remain and Leave voters, there's one from YouGov, one from Salvation, one from Delta Poll, but they all say essentially the same story. Um, you can see uh, for a start that um, amongst uh, uh, those um, who um, uh, voted Remain, that um, overwhelmingly they wish to remain. I mean, it's, it ranges between three quarters and 80% in these polls. Surprise, surprise, give Remain voters this choice and Remain voters say, well, I vote to remain. So the reason why Remain voters don't like the deal is at the end of the day, it is too hard. 
Meanwhile, however, as you can see, these polls all find around 50% of those who voted leave saying, in those circumstances, I would prefer to leave without a deal. And in these and virtually every poll, uh, leavers are keener on leaving without a deal, or more leavers are, uh, wish to have a, not to have a deal, than uh, that are back Mrs May's compromise. So the reason why leave voters are primarily opposed to the deal is that it's too hard. Uh, sorry, uh, it's too soft. So therefore, you can see the problem. Pro potential problem with a compromise. The lesson to take away from Mrs May's compromise is that it can be very difficult to satisfy the public um, because, um, in the end, the public are polarised between, on the one hand, the very substantial body of remainers who still wish to remain, and the not insubstantial body of Leave voters whose first preference is to leave without a deal. OK, so let's try and take the story forward. Where might we go from here? Is there another compromise that might fare rather better? Um, this is uh, data from uh, Opinium, um, which gave people, these are essentially procedural options. Um, so the left-hand side is having a deal on remaining versus, uh, versus the deal. The right-hand side is leaving without a deal. And then in between are a variety of options such as holding a general election, renegotiating to get a better deal. But of course, what a better deal might mean may vary according to what the voters think. And also having a referendum on deal versus no deal. Um, the Guardian yesterday got rather excited about the fact that ICM found that more people were in favour of leaving without a deal rather than in favour of the People's Vote style second referendum. But frankly, opinion had been showing it for months. But the crucial point to take away is not which is the most popular option. The crucial point to take away is that none of these options is particularly popular. And the truth is that insofar as there isn't a majority in the House of Commons for anything, the House of Commons is probably faithfully reflecting the state of British public opinion. And if we think that the job of a legislature is to represent public opinion, it's probably doing quite a good job. But then, but then also note, however, insofar as you know, there is something that's more popular than other things, that it is indeed, in this case, the two things that are at the opposite ends of the spectrum, the two polar opposite choices, which are the most popular uh, uh, choices. Um, and indeed, once you look underneath the bonnet and look at the views of Leave and Remain voters, at the end of the day, uh, given the set of choices they were offered, a referendum where the choice is between deal or remain is clearly the single most popular choice amongst remain voters. And conversely, amongst leave voters, the single most popular choice is leaving without a deal. And neither side is that keen on any of the options in between that one might wish to regard as some kind of compromise. Um, the same thing uh, picture emerges, and again, this is not unique in this respect, um, from a question that BMG Research um, asked uh, uh, back in December. So this focused on substantive options. So our left-hand side is uh, leaving on WTO terms. Then we have Canada. Then we have Norway. By the way, they explained these things to the punters. They didn't assume they knew what they were. Then we had Norway. Then we have the customs union, which is effectively Norway plus. And then on the right-hand side is, well, let's just remain inside the European Union, stay a member. Um, first of all, look at the blue lines. Um, are Canada and Norway, which are in effect roughly close to Jeremy Corbyn's compromise, are these particularly popular options amongst the public in general? Answer, no. These are the two least popular options, given the uh, set of options that were put before the electorate. Um, the, the public is polarised between, on the one hand, well, the Leave voters are divided between WTO and Canada, which is kind of not surprising, because arguably Canada, uh, but, but by Canada they mean, you know, not much regulatory alignment, thanks very much, um, is uh, the Leave voters' ideal position, but they'll take WTO if they can't get that. And meanwhile, Remain voters, at the end of the day, faced with these range of choices, by far and away, they would prefer to be the EU member. Um, 
Now, that said, however, you might at this point reasonably object to what I've shown you. You might say, well, hang on, if, but if we're searching for a compromise, maybe we should, well, we're really looking for something that maybe perhaps isn't the public's first preference, but perhaps is something that would be a second preference for both sides, might at least be regarded as being some kind of acceptable compromise. So let's have a look at uh, the, some of these options in that way. Um, now, this again is a di somewhat different set of options for BMG, but the advantage here is that voters were simply asked, do you support or oppose this option? Uh, and we've got, remaining in the EU, we've got Norway, so that's what I'm particularly interested in here, renegotiating the deal, which again could mean many different things, and then on the right-hand side, um, we've got uh, a leaving uh, without a deal. Um, first of all, uh, note how we may, uh, the, uh, in this actually all of these options kind of get slightly more people in favour than against, but that just reflects the fact that the polarisation of opinion. So Remain voters at the end of the day, you know, th these are figures for percentage support minus percentage opposed, so in the end there is a 70% majority amongst Remainers remaining in the EU, surprise, surprise. And conversely, an almost uh, uh, opposite uh, uh, view amongst Leave voters. Meanwhile, on the right-hand side, um, again, we've got uh, leaving with, that, with no deal. Well, basically, at the end of the day, it's relatively popular amongst leavers. It's decidedly unpopular amongst remainers. But what about the options in the middle? Well, renegotiating a better deal just about passes my test. There are slightly more people in favour, just, overall, than against. And both amongst remaining leave voters, there's just slightly more in favour than against. So this is the closest to a consensus, but as I've already indicated, you know, what people mean by negotiating a better deal, may, this is maybe something on which leavers and remainers do not agree. The really interesting here, well, here, one here is Norway. Norway doesn't pass my test because Norway, at the end of the day, is a Remainers' compromise, it is not a Leavers' compromise. It is clearly something that is relatively unpopular amongst Leavers, uh, uh, although it's relatively popular amongst Remainers, although albeit it's not as popular as it is amongst um, uh, as, as, uh, the uh, remaining in the EU. Another way of getting this, this was done by Anthony Wells um, last week or the week before, in which he asked people, again, on a range of options from leaving without a deal to having a referendum that would leave to result in a Remain vote. He was explicit about that. And, again, asking people, A, first of all, you know, the, the options were good outcome, bad outcome, acceptable compromise. So, again, trying to get at this idea. Well, first thing to note, you know, again, not surprisingly, leaving without a deal is the single most uh, popular option amongst leavers, um, but they're also, at the end of the day, relatively supportive of the deal. Um, but uh, uh, you know, that's, that's about as, 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 uh, as, as far as they will go. Um, what you will uh, see, what I want to focus on, is the idea of the single market and the customs union. So this, again, is the thing which kind of is kind of being clearest to the compromise that's currently uh, kicking around. Now, here, again, we get closer uh, to my tests. But even so, only, 20, uh, only around a quarter think that it's a good outcome, to which you can add another quarter who say, yep, it's an acceptable compromise, but... Um, even so, you've only still got around 50% of the public who are at least willing to regard it as something that they are willing uh, to contemplate. Um, and if you then go on, however, to look at what people say when you divide them into remainers and leavers about this, again, um, you see the difficulty, um, which is that... Um, Ah, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, this is looking explicitly at the, at the, at the answers to the, to the Canada question. So, again, right, the uh, blue side is Remain, the orange side are the Leavers. The Remainers, at the end of the day, are willing, a majority of them, to say it's either a good outcome or an acceptable compromise. You've got around two-thirds in that position. 
but you will notice that amongst Leave voters, it is still less than 50% who are willing to regard staying inside the uh, customs union and the single market as either being a good outcome or an acceptable compromise. So once you break the, uh, these attitudes down, even when you're looking at it, the attitude the subject separately, and you are allowing the option of saying it's acceptable compromise, you still do not pass my test because at the end of the day, a softer Brexit option does not look as though it's something that you can get majority support for amongst those who uh, voted to leave. Um, there's also a bit of older evidence on this, again in a similar vein, both done by Greenberg, Quinlan, Rosner and by YouGov. Greenberg, Quinlan, Rosner is on the left-hand side, YouGov is on the right. And uh, this was asking explicitly here simply whether or not staying inside the single market and the customs union would be acceptable or not. So not necessarily whether it's good, not whether it's in a favour, but at the end of the day, is it something up with which you are willing to put? Um, and again, uh, however, the difficulty that you find is that yes, Remain voters say that this is something up with which they are willing to put, but Leave voters pretty decidedly say they don't. And it's there in YouGov, and it's there in Greenberg, Quinn and Rosna. So moving towards the soft Brexit compromise of the kind the Labour Party seems to be interested in, of the kind that perhaps Yvette Cooper is interested in, doesn't solve the problem either. At the end of the day, this is not something that Leave voters are likely to find as acceptable. And indeed, you know, one other word of warning about a Norway-style option. Um, there's a rather interesting poll done by Servation a week ago in which they asked the same voters, first of all, how would you vote if it was Remain, Mrs May's deal, or leaving without a deal. Those are the blue lines. And as you might now have expected from what I showed you earlier, Mrs May's deal comes third. They were then also asked, how would you vote if the choice was between remain, Norway, and leaving without a deal? And Norway is as much of a third place as Mrs May's deal. It's a different body of voters, but it's as much a third place. So if perhaps one possible meaning of the amendment to the uh, uh, government statement yesterday party has come up with is that it might try to pursue Mr Corbyn's preferred soft Brexit compromise, but then perhaps might also still be willing to put that to the public, be careful what you wish for, because that may also bomb in much the same way as Mrs May's deal. Okay, what about then looking about the very specific issue of, um, the, of having a vote on uh, uh, remaining versus leaving? In other words, at the end of the day, throwing our hands up in the air and saying that the House of Commons can't answer this question. Let's pass the buck back to the public and see what they say. Well, do the public want the buck passed to them? This is one of those areas where you can either regard opinion polls uh, as an extremely frustrating instrument that end up telling you nothing, or you regard, can regard them as something that gives you a pretty important insight to what are the things that potentially shape public attitudes towards a subject. What, however, the, the opinion polls do not do is to demonstrate clear support for holding a people's vote of the kind that is being advocated by the people's vote campaign, despite the attempt of the people's vote campaign itself to commission a number of polls that supposedly demonstrate that that is the case. Why do I say all these things? Right, well, first of all, um, they're, 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 one of the fr frustrations, yeah, for people like me, you know, one of the frustrations about the polling about a second referendum is that every time somebody asks a question about this, they ask a different question from the one they asked last time. So when people say to me, is it more popular now than it was? I go, I frankly don't know. Nobody in the last two months has asked the same questions they asked six months or 12 months ago. So we have to park that question. Um, we've got one or two instances of the same question being asked within the last two months, but, that, but that's it. So I'm, but I'm, I'm now just focusing on those questions that have been asked since the 15th of November about the subject. And by my count, 
Well, I think as of yesterday, there were 13. I think there might now be 14 polls with differently worded questions on whether or not there should be a second referendum. However, there's an extraordinarily clear pattern. Um, these are the most recent readings, in some cases be more than one. These are the most recent readings for all the polls that, whose question have the following two characteristics. First of all, they refer to the idea of a people's vote or a public vote. The second crucial characteristic is they do not make it clear that remain would be an option on the ballot paper. They say things like, should there be a public vote on whether to accept or reject Mrs May's deal? Without saying what rejection would mean. A number of these polls, by the way, have been commissioned by people like uh, Best for Britain and the People's Vote campaign. Indeed, the phrase people's vote is the result of opinion poll research that they commission. Now, if you do it, ask it in that way, typically you will get more people in favour or against. You don't get more than 50% of people saying they're in favour, but you get more people in favour and against, and you can therefore go out campaigning saying, actually, the public want to have another say on this. Here, however, is another set of opinion polls, all taken in the last two months, in some cases by exactly the same polling company that was responsible for some of the polls um, in my first slide. The characteristic of these polls is that, first of all, they refer to a referendum. They don't refer to a people's vote. They refer, should there be a second referendum, another referendum, a new referendum? But they, 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 that's what they refer to. The second thing about all these polls is they either, most cases explicitly and one or two cases implicitly, make it clear that remain would be an option on the ballot paper. And when you ask it that way, as you can see, you consistently get more people saying there again than say that they are in favour. And therefore, in so far as the proposition of the People's Vote campaign is indeed to hold a referendum in which Remain is on the ballot paper, I do not think that at the moment we can argue that there is clear equivocal support, majority support, for holding a second EU referendum. Now, you might then be wondering, so why the devil do we get this difference? Um, and actually, it's uh, fairly striking and very clear. Remainers are quite clear about this. It doesn't matter how you ask the question. Around two-thirds of Remain voters from poll to poll say, yeah, I want a people's vote. I want another referendum. You don't, they don't care what you call it. But for Leave voters, it makes a difference. Using that populist language of a people's vote or a public vote. You know, one of the, to the questions get close to that. Should the public have the final say on Mrs May's deal or not? Well, you know, surprise, surprise, some Leave voters go, yeah, you know what, that might be quite a good idea so we can make sure that we can defeat it and get out there on WTO terms, which I don't think is what the People's Vote campaign have in mind. Um, so if you use that language and you don't make it clear the remains on the ballot paper, I mean, Leave voters are still opposed. So again, this is not a compromise that passes my test. This is a Remainer project. Whether it need be a Remainer project is perhaps another interesting question. But given the way the People's Vote campaign have played it, this is how it's emerged. But if you use the more populist language, you can get a quarter of Leave voters to say, yeah, I support it. If you drop that and make it clear it's Remain that's an option, the proportion drops to an eighth. So the truth is, holding a second EU referendum is also a divisive proposition. You're getting there. There is no compromise that will satisfy my tests. Still, I guess some of you are saying, well, I hope he's going to tell us what would happen if we were to have a second EU referendum. So although it is somewhat tangential to what my, my central thesis, uh, let me indulge you for just a moment. Um, one, the question that's been asked most often, of course, is not a question that uh, asks explicitly how you would vote. It's a, but it's a question that's been asked by you, Gav, very regularly in hindsight. Do you think Britain was right or wrong to vote to leave? By the way, just make sure. I've done the thing that you tell your students never, ever to do. Zero is not the origin. But I've done it so you can actually see such change as there is, because if I were to make zero the option, you'd kind of go, I don't understand that graph. Okay, so blue is right, 
orange is red, and in order to make sense of what is, what, 150 odd now readings or so, I've kind of, you know, uh, averaged them out over um, two or three month time periods. Before the 2017 election, YouGov tended to find more people saying that the decision was right rather than wrong. Since the 2017 election, they've tended to have the opposite. And as you will notice, as we go towards the, where we are at the moment, there is some sign in YouGov's polling that perhaps more recently we have moved uh, to slightly rather more people saying that it's wrong than it is right. So there is some evidence in this question of, uh, of movement. Movement that predates, however, Mrs. May's deal. What, however, happens if we look at those polls that ask people, what would you do if there were to be another referendum? This is a running average of the last six polls, which you can basically do since the beginning of last year. The blue is remain, the green is leave. So yes, you've got it. There are more people consistently in the polls who say they would vote remain than say they would vote leave. And although it's probably pretty difficult to tell because the movement is relatively recent, for most of last year, certainly until October of last year, you were looking at remain 52, leave 48. In October, it started to rise to remain 53, leave 47, so the movement predates the deal again. And most recently, it's now shifted to remain 54, leave 46. So yes, remain seemed to be ahead, not overwhelmingly ahead, um, but consistently and perhaps slightly increasingly so. However, once you look underneath the bonnet, you should appreciate why we should not assume that the outcome of a second referendum would be what the people's vote are hoping for. So what I'm now doing, I'm taking uh, the last 13 polls that have been uh, conducted uh, uh, on this subject. Uh, the columns are how people voted or did not vote in 2016, and the rows are how people say they would vote now. Point number one, as I suspect we will get more of later this morning, is that most Remain and Leave voters have not changed their minds. They are committed to their cause. 87% of Remain voters say they would vote the same way. 83% of Leave voters say they would vote the same way. The Leave vote is slightly softer than the Remain vote. But as you can see, the proportion of Leave voters who say they would switch to Remain is only slightly greater than the proportion of uh, Remain voters who would switch to leave. The principal reason why we seem to be looking at a different balance of public opinion is because those who did not vote two and a half years ago are in all of the opinion polls now decidedly more pro-Remain than leave. I've actually got some data where you can track this over time. Um, if you ask people who didn't vote in 2016 how they would have voted, you'd get about 55, 45 remain. If you track it over time, however, it's pretty clear that those who did not vote have become more, uh, a, a more pro-remain group, uh, but certainly particularly from the middle of last year. Um, and that therefore, insofar as there has been movement and a change of mind, or perhaps frankly, people making up their minds rather late in the day, it's been amongst those who did not participate two and a half years ago, who are, of course, disproportionately younger voters, and in some cases, people who would not have uh, been able to vote. There's, a, of course, another, uh, there's still a question of what would be on the ballot paper, and remain versus leave is only one option. Another obvious option is to have remain versus Mrs. May's deal. And indeed, I think Dominic Grieve is beginning to show some sense about how you sell this prop uh, their proposition of another referendum to the Leavers, and that is to say, well, let's give Mrs. May at May's deal a chance. You can't get it through the House of Commons. Give her a chance to get it past the public. And I think, frankly, that is the argument the People's Vote campaign should have got into quite some time ago. But there we go. Um, if you are, uh, so again, these are uh, uh, all the questions have been asked in this kind of way. The green line are those people they so they say they'd vote for Remain. The blue line are those who say they vote for Leave. Uh, but crucially, crucially, the black line are the don't knows. Now, if you look at that and you would take the don't knows out, you will get much more than a 54-46 lead for Remain. So therefore, it would look as though that if we were to have a referendum in which there was a binary choice between the deal and remain, it would be easier for, re for remain to win than the question of principle. 
However, as Opinium in particular quite rightly pointed out at the weekend, beware the don't knows. Because at the, end, what, the reason primarily why you're getting this relatively large remain lead in response to this question is that around one in three vote, uh, leave voters go, I don't like that choice. I don't know what I would do. But you should not by now be surprised because you now already know that a lot of leave voters would prefer no deal to Mrs May's deal. And that they're therefore saying, uh, uh, saying don't know. I think the honest truth is the only reasonable assumption to make is if voters were to be presented with that binary choice that probably most of those don't knows would end up in the leave camp and that therefore the 54-46, uh, subject to the caveat that it all depend on the turnout, is probably the best guide to what might happen next. Okay, briefly to my cadenza. What about the political parties? Uh, where do they stand? What are their constraints and opportunities? And to what extent um, are their electorates reflecting uh, this uh, division? And you know, is there a compromise that's going to satisfy Conservative and Labour voters? You can guess the answer to that question already. Um, first thing to note, shouldn't surprise you, is that around two-thirds of uh, uh, the, those who voted Conservative would currently say they would vote Leave. Around two-thirds of those who vote Labour say they would currently vote Remain. And to that extent, at least, our two political parties do articulate the Remain-Leave divide. Um, they do so at moment, by my reckoning, by still roughly the same extent as they did after the 2017 election, which, of course, however, is a more exaggerated reflection of the division as it existed in 2016. So the resorting of the vote that happened uh, to Tory and Labour in the 2017 general election still seems to be there. The Labour vote is more remain than it was in 2016. The Conservative vote is certainly more leave than it was in 20, 2016, but probably isn't any more so now than it was after the general um, election. Um, so to that extent, at least, there has been some sorting of the electorate. But you know, where do the p voters of the party stand on this subject? Well, you can kind of guess what I'm, I'm going to show you. At the end of the day, the most popular choice amongst uh, uh, conservative voters, looking at Opinion's procedural question, is indeed to leave without a deal. Now, we can all think of the reasons why Theresa May isn't terribly, but just simply within the confines of her parliamentary party, doesn't think that attacking towards a soft Brexit is a terribly good idea. But when you look at the views of conservative voters, you can see that the pressures that she faced inside the House of Commons not to move in that direction are going to be reinforced by any reasonable understanding of the views of her electorate. Uh, meanwhile, however, equally, you can see why the Labour Party ain't going to drop the idea of a second EU referendum because this is still something that's very popular amongst Labour voters. And indeed, on, on the procedural issues, the division between Conservative and Labour voters is pretty similar to the division, even in, in, in its extent, as it is on, um, uh, to between Remainers and Leavers. On the substantive questions, not to the same extent, but again, as you can see, the idea that Conservative voters are going to embrace the Norway deal is, un is, is unlikely. Again, this is just simply asking people whether they're for or against the various propositions, even just asked in that way, Conservative voters are inclined to be against the Norway deal. Um, and again, exactly the same evidence from you, Gov. Um, conservative voters um, are uh, basically do, uh, uh, you know, only around 40% of Conservative voters are at least willing to think of having a Norway style soft Brexit. Uh, single market, et cetera, as being an acceptable compromise. So there is, frankly, very little incentive for the Conservatives to move in that direction. But equally, however, you can see how for the Labour Party, but only for the Labour Party, it is a position around which you might at least hope to maintain the support of most of your voters. That said, of course, then when we come to the issue of a second referendum, Again, you can see why Mrs May is not going to embrace this, because 60% of Conservative voters are again. And again, you can see why, um, at the end of the day, the uh, Labour Party is not going to drop the idea, because it's clear that a majority, but it's a majority, it's by no means 100% of Labour voters are in favour, although Tim Baer will tell us that their members are rather keener. Okay, so, to conclude... <clears throat> 
there doesn't seem to be any procedural or substantive option that is currently before us that appears to be both widely capable, but widely popular and capable of bridging the Brexit divide. Soft Brexit is a Remainers compromise. It is not a compromise that will bring the public together. And it runs the risk of being as little loved as Mrs May's compromise or of Chequers before that. Second referendum is not as popular as is sometimes claimed. And in any event, it's also a Remainers solution to the impasse. And although Conservative and Labour have obvious incentives to seek a compromise, at the end of the day, they also have to, uh, have to understand that their voters reflect the Brexit divide that limits the extent to which Mrs May can move, even if she weren't constrained by her, her parliamentary party. But equally, you can also see why the Labour Party are pursuing a softer Brexit agenda. But I think you know, the lesson I would take away is that, is that you know, our politicians are constantly being told not least by students of Downsian theory and political science, that what you should be doing is seeking the center ground of British politics. That may often be good advice. But the problem with Brexit is that the, thin, is that the center ground of British politics is rather thinly populated. And that maybe the me message that our politicians need to take away is another piece of political folk wisdom, which is that to govern is to choose. And that maybe at the end of this process, it is going to be impossible to satisfy more than half the people. Thank you so much, uh, Sir John, for that splendid tour de force of recent public opinion polling. I, I did, maybe I missed it, but uh, we'll now open this to, to question and answers. But I think I missed you telling us what would happen, according to current polling, if there was a three-way choice between deal, no deal. No, no, no you, did, you did miss it. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the answer, according to most polling, Though I have to be fair, not absolutely all. Most polling has remained first, it has no deal second, it has deal third, and because uh, if you then were to run it as an alternative vote, um, because uh, uh, those who vote for deal uh, will break more in favour of remain, which is already further ahead anyway, uh, than, uh, than for no deal, um, then remain usually ends up the winner. But, crucial caveat, it, the outcome could well depend on who comes second. Yeah. If deal were to come second, then the outcome of the referendum could be much tighter. And indeed, I think you, Gavin, one of these exercises brilliantly came up with a result of 50.1% remain, 49.9% Mrs May's deal. And of course, we know this is potentially one of the problems with trying to deal with a three-way referendum. So the re the, uh, who won the race for second could be crucial to the outcome in terms of who actually wins. Thank you, John. Now, um, I'll open the floor for question. The gentleman there in the jacket and white shirt in the back, please. If you could all introduce yourselves and then ask your question, please. All right. Uh, Colin Irwin, University of Liverpool. I'm wondering if um, we should shift the paradigm here. Your, your test is to see if some option, one way or another, might go 50% plus. But, in, uh, but we've got a very divided society now, which uh, looks very much like a, a conflict resolution problem more than um, just getting sort of first past the post kind of a problem. And in a conflict resolution problem, one needs to look at the, the, the questions and the analysis in a very different way. So if you're working in Northern Ireland or some of these conflicts around the world, what you want to do is find out what is the least uh, worst option, what people will uh, accept um, uh, more, more, than, more than something else. Uh, so what is, what is um, least unacceptable in, as opposed to what is most acceptable? And if you run the questions in that way, you get a very different kind of analysis and you can 
uh, bring the people towards a solution. So, for example, the BMG stuff, they only ask what your first choice is. And then they do some pairing, but that's very inadequate. What they need to do is test all options against all other options to see which is the uh, least, re uh, least rejectable option and then work from there. So I think if you use a conflict resolution paradigm as opposed to the paradigm you're using, you might get some more useful results that would be more enlightening and, and helpful to the general public and the politicians. Okay, with respect, Colin, I think I did do what you suggested we should do. I showed you the answers to a number of polls uh, that asked people whether, for example, something would be a good outcome or an acceptable compromise. I also showed you other polling data which simply asked people whether or not something would be acceptable or unacceptable. Those uh, uh, questions did also not pass my test. And I would point out to you that in the end of the day, the only way that the, the Northern Ireland um, uh, a, a peace process only finally got on board when you, in the end, clearly got a majority of both unionists as well as nationalists on board, though, of course, it's also rather run into the sand in the last couple of years. Thank you. So, uh, gentleman here in the front, please. In the white shirt and black jacket. Peter Wilson Smith from Meritus Consultants. I can't think of a, another sort of major political issue in my lifetime where there's been such a stark generational divide on this. And I wonder if you could say a few words about that and how you sort of see that in the context of your analysis. I mean, some of the polling I've looked at suggests, I mean, leaving aside the sort of demographic change, um, that uh, views have become more polarised. Over 65s have shifted actually slightly more towards leave and uh, vice versa among younger voters. Um, well, you're certainly absolutely right. There's an enormous demographic divide on attitudes towards the subject. There's an enormous divide also by educational background. Right? And doubtless we'll get more discussion about this during the course of the day. Um, I can't remember when I last checked whether the demographic divide has become wider or not. It's certainly not narrowed perceptibly. Whether it's widened or not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but yes, the demographic divide is, is, is enormous. It's still there. The educational divide is enormous. So you know, the, the point, therefore, is not only will we kind of polarised in terms of our options, but the, those two options represent very, very different sections of our society, which, again, is one of the reasons why I understand why people are wanting to search for the compromise that might somehow or other bring these two communities together. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that I think it's fine for us not to be able to find a compromise. Let's make that clear. However, I, I think it's, to, I have to be honest with you as an academic to say that at the moment, the ground for the compromise that will bring those uh, two communities together doesn't seem to exist. I mean, you know, one other thought is, I think at this point, uh, one other obvious objection to what I've done is to say, well, look, you know, you're taking public opinion as it is, maybe we can shift it. But the question to ask yourself is this. Who is there currently in the forefront of British politics who will be capable of arguing for one or other of these compromises in such a way that they will be persuasive, both amongst Remain and amongst Leave voters, that you might actually bring people together. Or perhaps drawing the analogy that Colin invited us to do about Northern Ireland, who in combination could be the equivalent of Ian Paisley and, um, uh, I've forgotten his name, the former... Uh, yeah, thanks, yeah, right, absolutely. Who, 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 who could bring the, the, the country together? I would suggest to you that at the moment we don't seem to have that uh, uh, facility at elite level and you know, at the moment therefore we are the, the, the most articulate uh, of folk are at the moment at one or other end of the spectrum with probably the relievers having particularly the more articulate politicians. Okay, the lady in white here in the front. Thank you. I'm Millie from Gloucestershire, and I am a member of the public, so no academic credentials. Um, I wonder if you could just shed a bit of light on the sort of recent uh, feedback that when people are asked about a no deal, many of them misunderstand the entire concept of a no deal and may think it's voting for sort of everything to stay broadly the same. I'm sorry, I'm going to duck that question because I've, 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 I've not been following that story. I don't know if there's anybody else anybody in the room else? who has. 
Otherwise, I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer the question by correspondence, but I, I, I've seen it going around on my Twitter feed. But um, to be honest, um, preparing this and one or two other things, I've, I've not got into that question. Okay, uh, the gen there still be other experts on public opinion, so maybe uh, later on it will be addressed. Uh, the gentleman in the, the front here. James Campbell, University of, of uh, Cambridge. I was wondering if you could just expand a little bit more on the answer that you gave uh, previously about leadership. You brilliantly preempted my question, which is, th th when you were doing your studies, did you look at the impact of Corbyn as a leader? Because it would strike me that he's, not a, he's quite an active moving part here, stabilizing preferences of moderate Tory voters, um, changing public sentiment towards different options. Did you get a sense of the quantitative impact of, of, of Corbyn? No, um, having even attempted to do so, and impossible to do so with the kind of data that I'm using. Okay, uh, the lady here uh, in the front, please. Sorry for these negative answers, but I have to be <laughs> honest with you. <laughs> No, that one's not working. Have we got another microphone in the room? Hang on, there's another microphone coming. Just there's, a second. There's another one. One, two? Yeah, yep. perfect. My name's Henriette from Switzerland. I'm wondering, would there be a difference in the opinion polls if politicians like Boris Johnson would start to say, well, customs union would not be too bad? I know it's, we can't imagine that, but is there kind of a connection between the politicians and the... Uh... Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I think it, 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 it's, it's a not unreasonable proposition that... If, in particular, um, the Brexiteers fall in behind the deal at some point, if somehow or another, by some miracle or other, Mrs May can get something that, that both the European Union is willing to give and the Brexiteers are willing to accept, um, that, and that therefore we stop having Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson saying, let's just crash out, that that might well shift opinion, particularly shift opinion amongst Conservative voters. I think that's you know, an entirely reasonable proposition, which again, is another reason for basically at the moment not taking too much notice of polls that say how would people vote if they would face the choice between Remain and the deal. But they're still going to be argu arguing for leave, so therefore, you know, they're still probably going to start from slightly behind. But yes, no, absolutely. I think this is almost... A, so in other words, you know, insofar as I have argued that the principle, you know, for the most part, voters on this side of the water are not vote, uh, uh, objecting to the deal because of the intricacies of the backstop. It's because, you know, more broadly, you know, they've got the message that the backstop is somehow or another is a constraint on our sovereignty, and maybe also they've even got the subtler argument, which I finally heard somebody articulate clearly on the Today programme this morning, which is that the backstop potentially constrains the nature of the trade deal that we could get. Um, that, uh, so they've kind of got the message that it's kind of, it's not good. Clearly, if that message were to stop the communicator and they were told, well, actually, it's all right now, the backstop isn't a constraint on our sovereignty, that might help to shift a substantial body of leave voters. But, you know, it's not, I don't think it's going to persuade very many Remain voters of the merits of Mrs May's deal, and we would still end up with a referendum um, uh, that is divisive. But I guess... I mean, Annan has been kind of criticising in second EU referendum on the grounds as divisive. In a sense, I'm saying that's not an attribute that's unique to a second EU referendum. It's frankly true of whatever we do, and therefore is not a unique objection to a second EU referendum. Okay. Gentleman in the back there in a the green jumper. Wait for the microphone. Wait for the please. microphone. Okay. Uh, my name's Steve Freeman. You could distinguish between the 1998 Scottish referendum and the 2014. 1998, you were ratifying something that was on the table. You were going yes or no to that. Whereas in 2014, you were voting to remain in the UK or leave when you didn't quite know what leave the UK would actually mean. So one is ratification. It's very important. Now, at the present moment, you could see the completion of the 2016 referendum would be to ratify whatever the government has gone away and come up with. So there ought to be a ratification referendum where people are simply asked, do you support Theresa May's deal or not? Now, you gave us the evidence that that sort of works, at least at the level of getting one 
possible option off the table because Parliament has voted it down and it's still alive, this uh, thing that Parliament, and which you already showed, the people didn't like it either. So we might get to a better place if we had a simple ratification, but not a second repeat remain referendum which is highly divisive so i think your figures kind of showed that that would sort so can of i ask you what then is the, what, what then is the uh, what happens if we don't ratify if do we, we do we go back and negotiate again well if we don't ratify then mrs may is gone so the tories would either have to get boris johnson or somebody like that okay. they don't. Right, I think so I you'd have to sense. have you'd have to have okay you'd have to have a general election at that point yes you would have to carry on but the point is bouncing something through that nobody in the country really okay. wants is very dangerous I, I, okay I, 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 thank you sure I, I understand the argument um, um and the truth is of course that um history has also repeated itself in this way in that both sides in the 2014 Scottish independence referendum agree to play poker. Both sides agree that there shouldn't be a second referendum of the kind that you're talking about. There is a not unreasonable argument. Indeed, during the course of the Scottish independence debate, I was amongst those that saying, well, actually, might be, you know, it, it might make sense. But, you know, unsurprisingly, um, those who are in favour of independence ain't too keen on a two referendum uh, process and they share that attribute with Leave voters because Leave voters think they've got what they, what they want and therefore they are deeply reluctant to put it uh, uh, potentially at risk. So I understand the democratic argument. Um, the, prob uh, the problem is that, as in Scotland, people were told this was the decisive vote. Therefore, you do give those who aren't very keen on the idea a very simple argument, which is, you know, supposedly this is undemocratic because you're told, you know, you would, you, you would follow this vote. So that's why in the end up, it ends up being a, a deeply contentious subject. Question here at the front, please. Just wait for the microphone. Uh, thank you. Uh, John, you're wondering whether or not there are any strong views for or against extending Article 50. Um, there is polling out there. I didn't show it to you because it then all depends on why, the, why it is you are extending Article 50. Um, I presume we are going to extend Article 50 anyway, irrespective of what happens. I, the Prime Minister seemed to be speaking yesterday as though time was no object, but anyway. Um, but um, uh, you know, I think, for example, I, I, my memory is when you ask that question cold, you kind of get a 50-50 split. And the leavers, are ter it doesn't sound terribly nice. And the remainers go, oh, hang on, this is a possible lifeboat. But of course, at the end, you know, the, the, at this point, there are two very different reasons why we could be wanting to extend the Article 50. One is that Mrs May finally gets the deal through, but she doesn't, doesn't have time to get the legislation through, which now seems pretty obvious. But the second is that we're extending Article 50 because the Yvette Cooper Amendment has been passed or whatever, and we are wanting to uh, go away and have a referendum or a general election or a softer Brexit. Those are two very, very different propositions. Okay, the final question here at the front, the gentleman at the front, please. Is there a microphone coming, please? I'll show it, don't worry. No, no, no. There's... Ah, no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jim Gallagher from Nuffield. John, just to follow up that question, uh, what do you think of the idea put down by uh, Gordon Brown and John Major and Stella Creasy that we should extend uh, for a year or so by going to some kind of process of national consultation and then maybe have another referendum at the end of that if that's the outcome of the process of national consultation? Because what you've demonstrated is that neither the public nor the parliament will support anything at the moment so perhaps we'd better do nothing. Well, I'm perhaps rather more interested than you might realise because I'm funded by the SRC to run a not dissimilar exercise, although it's pre at the moment it's predicated on the assumption that we are going to leave and, it was an, and, and the uh, object of the exercise is to not do a citizens' assembly but to do a deliberative poll kind of slightly bigger exercise, um, where the aim was to try to ascertain where the public might stand on post-Brexit public policy, such as what should be our immigration policy post-Brexit. If, however, within a matter of a few months, we are still in the middle of this Brexit process, we might end up having to do at least the first phase of this project on something that looks at this. But of course, there's no guarantee. I mean, we can engage in a deliberative process, uh, 
But whether the deliberative process will change anybody's mind or find a consensus that's capable of being sold to the wider public, I mean, there certainly is no guarantee. But uh, certainly, you know, I have no objection to, to doing it. And to some degree, I'm kind of slightly interested in the industry of helping to facilitate um, such an exercise. So maybe you and I should talk later. Well, please join me in thanking Sir John Curtis.